We'll start off this week's show with information about the future of the Grand Cherokee. And we'll hear what got one cheaper on the wannabe list. Does your JK have headlight flicker? We'll get into the cause and the cure later in the show. Gina from nomnews.com is here with more trailside recipes to make us drool. Nikki G calls in and will answer your voicemails. We've got a lot of tech for you this week on episode 263. We'll go into details about the right used diesel option for a UK Jeep Liberty, and we'll get more into locker selection for Juice. We've even got some used Jeep buying tips for a local buyer here in the States. Hey, Tony and Josh, it's Tammy, and I'm hoping by now you guys have got all the butt jokes out of your system. <laughs> um, everything's fine. It was the roughest part was 35 hours of not eating solid foods. But anyway, afterwards, I went and had nachos and tacos, so everything's good. Um, right now, as you're probably listening to this, I'm probably in bed sleeping because it was a little exhausting. Um, anyway, I'm excited for next week. Um, I got some new parts in and I'm going to be fixing a problem I have in my Jeep. So anyway, stay tuned for next week. And it, you guys and, have a great show. <laughs> Love you. And of course, I'm assuming the new parts have to do with the Jeep and not the procedure she went through. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network Podcast. Are you ready? It's the G-Talk Show. With Tammy on Wrangler. Tony and Josh on Cherokee. So sit back. Strap in. And brace yourself. First week in G. The next generation of, G- of Jeep Grand Cherokees will be more Italian than they will be German. Today's Jeep Grand Cherokee will split at birth from the Mercedes-Benz midsize M-Class. It's true. Many years ago, the two SUVs shared a development path during the Daimler Chrysler era. With Daimler long out of the picture and now the seven-year-old Jeep Grand Cherokee aging, quite gracefully we might add, Fiat Chrysler must begin work on a replacement. But what platform to use? Well, at the uh, Detroit Auto Show, the automaker CEO, Sergio Marchione, told us that the next Grand Cherokee will borrow compliments from Alfa Romeo. Specifically, the next Grand Cherokee is to be spun off of Alfa Romeo's rear-drive chassis architecture. Although Marchione didn't elaborate much, now we're assuming he was talking about the same bones that form the basis of the Giulia sedan and the upcoming Stelvio SUV. They also happen to comprise Fiat Chrysler's freshest rear-wheel drive-based component set. The longitudinal drive layout being a virtual requirement for the traditional four-wheel drive equipment, including a two-speed transfer case with low-range gearing that the Grand Cherokee has always guaranteed to offer. Well, the news isn't necessarily a surprise, but it is illuminating about Fiat Chrysler's thinking on economies of scale and platform sharing among among its numerous brands. So what does this mean, then, for the future of Jeep's flagship off-road SUV? We expect that, like the current model, the new Grand Cherokee will feature a fortified unibody, so it won't just be a a tall Julia rebodied Stelvio, basically. A full independent suspension is also likely in a V6 and V8 engine choices, of course. Rear-wheel drive will be standard as it is today, and a range of four-wheel drive systems will be available. Again, expect the hardcore versions to boast low-range gearing and locking differentials to preserve Jeep's off-road credibility. Or so we would hope, at least. Stay tuned right here for the latest on this and other Jeep platforms. Well, the Jeep and the birthday suit. Let's go ahead and let that stew for a minute. <laughs> well, police are searching for a naked man who chased after two teenage Ooh. girls as they were walking along the road in Burlington County, New Jersey. Police say it happened around 1 p.m. Friday in the area of Ravens Row and Fox Chase Road in Evansham Township. Authorities say a 15-year-old girl and her 14-year-old friend were walking to the basketball courts near Westerly Drive when they noticed the man wasn't wearing a shirt when he initially drove back by them in a black Jeep. He then returned there a few minutes later and was completely naked. They couldn't tell he was wearing any clothes at this point because it was then he decided to exit the vehicle, suddenly bolting from the Jeep and running full sprint towards the girls. Doing what I think any of us would do when faced with such a pasty floppy mess like this, the girls then ran to the older teen's house and told her father what happened. They say the man didn't say anything to them during the incident and did not touch them. The father of the one teen was last seen with night vision goggles and a shotgun. <laughs> Authorities responded to the home where the call to 911 had been made, but by the time they finally decided to stop issuing traffic tickets and arrived on scene, the man had long since driven away. The vehicle he was driving is described as a black Jeep Cherokee style with no tire on the back and a white decal on the right side of the window. Police are asking anyone who witnessed the incident or has information on the identity of the suspect to contact them at 856-983-1116. 
I want to thank all of you guys out there who contact us each and every week by submitting stories for This Week in Jeep. And if you think you should have, uh, re- if you think you have a response to any one of our stories or something that you think we should be reporting on, rather, by all means, send us an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com. You know, Josh, I was uh, very tempted to throw in that fifth picture during the... Uh Thank God. <laughs> that was the point. <laughs> I know. I didn't realize. And then I was reading the show notes and I saw those those supposed to put it there. So <laughs> now I'm putting it up now. I was I was trying uh, to I was trying to okay. be good and not, like, uh, is this, this was supposed to be in and there. Not, <laughs> and not point you out as the guy that was driving around in a black Jeep with no, the pants. I mean, clearly, uh, if anybody's listened to this show for the last <laughs> three to six months, they know that my Jeep one isn't running and two that I live on the West Coast and really have never been much on the East Coast well, all alone with my Jeep. So. I get left and right confused all the time. You know, so. it's he went that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right. Well, I screwed that up, but uh, hilarity is Thanks, insane. Tony. <laughs> Glad you're feeling better, pal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coughing less anyway. Uh, you know, I'll just uh, I'll just mention this real quick. The uh, the Grand Cherokee stuff, you know, I'm not a Grand Cherokee fan. I've always viewed the Grand Cherokee as a yuppie mobile. Uh, they had them in there in the showroom floor whenever I got the, uh, the XJ. And I looked over there and I thought, why in the hell would I want to spend thirty two thousand, thirty four thousand dollars? Going <laughs> well, this is this <laughs> oh, is in ninety eight, yeah, yeah. ninety eight. Sure. Uh, you know, why would I want to spend you know ten to uh, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars more for this Grand Cherokee for the, this damn Yuppie Mobile? I mean, it was bad enough I was getting a station wagon, right? So, uh, but now looking at them, the the styling that they have on the Grand Cherokees, it certainly isn't an off road vehicle. In, in my advice, I mean, in my opinion, I should say, uh, but uh, it, it is a nice looking vehicle. It'd be fun to drive around on the road, and especially that one with uh, what's the uh, what's the big time motor that they're they're putting in in them now. The, oh, uh, well, they got the uh, the Hellcat uh, yeah, SRT. Hellcat. Yeah, that that's uh, that is one heck of a Grand Cherokee right there. Yeah, yeah, it'd be uh, it'd be a lot of fun to have. Uh, yeah, I just love the horsepower. So I mean that you know for a, just for a commuter. I mean that's a street jeep. Yeah, very true. All right, well let's uh, let's get over to something we haven't had in quite a while, and it's uh, not because she hasn't been trying. Uh, she goes out and, and does all these uh, cooking things. And if you uh, if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about Gina over at nomnews.com. And of course, uh, if you ever need a, a food fix. You can go over there and uh, just go to that site and have a look and see what Gina's up to. But uh, let's see uh, what we have uh, uh, this time for Gina and uh, her uh, off-road cooking segment. Hey guys, Gina here with Nam News, and I want to show you my great spinach in artichoke bread bowl. All right, this is great to cook on the trail because you basically just buy this bread bowl. All right, I bought mine right at Walmart. You can get them just about any store that you go to, and then you're just gonna hollow that out and just uh, create a crater in the inside, dig out some of the uh, bread, and then you're gonna make the spinach and artichoke dip. You can also buy it, but I will include my recipe for my spinach and artichoke. You're gonna put the top back on, compress that, and then you are gonna wrap that in three layers of aluminum foil. All right, that is then gonna cook underneath your hood while you're out on the trail. About three hours is perfect. You're gonna see how we did this when we went to Ure, Colorado this fall. We were doing Yankee Boy Basin, which was amazing. We love going up in the San Juan Mountains. Uh, They also had a uh, Jeep trail going on there with the Jeep Jamboree, which was fun. We kind of saw a lot of the Jeeps while we were out there. We go every year in September out to Ure. And as we went up to the Yankee Boy Basin, we were uh, almost to the top that we could go to. And we sat there, it started snowing. Yes, in September it was snowing, which is crazy to think, but uh, that's why you can only go from say June to September because they really get quite a bit of snow the rest of the year. So we actually got some snow when we were up there. At the end of us eating our great spinach and artichoke bowl, we threw out just the remainder of the bottom of the bowl knowing that there'd be some animals that would love that instead of just throwing it away and little did we know a little fox while we were all sitting there came right out and took that so watch this a uh, little clip and I'll show you how that fox came and we were all like oh my goodness that's awesome so that was really fun to see so I hope you guys enjoy my trail food and I'm Gina again with Nam News and here's my spinach and artichoke bread bowl okay so I have my spinach and artichoke bread bowl great appetizer hot appetizer I'm gonna tuck this right in right here 
here. It is perfect. All right, we want it to be nice and tight when the hood comes down. We're gonna check that in a couple hours. Up in the mountains, if you can see, we are in Ure, Colorado. They also known as the Switzerlands of America. Jeep Jamboree is also in town this week, and I will see you up on the trail. Let's check this out, Let's see what we check got. It out. Let's see if this, uh, I'm ready for warm Hot lunch dip. after snowing up here at uh, what the, Yankee Boy Basin. We're at Yankee Boy, Yankee Boy Basin. 12,400 feet. 12,400 12, feet. No wonder I can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, of course, this is wrapped in many layers because we want to protect our engine. Oh my goodness. This is what you get when you're out on the trail for hours, okay? You need something hot, you need an appetizer. I call this appy hour. Not happy hour, but appy hour. This is my appetizer. So we are all gonna dig in. We have some great crackers, and we're gonna dig in and get this great spinach and artichoke dip. Who brought the crackers? Mm, I brought the <laughs> crackers. Do you remember to bring the crackers? I'll have to my face See you guys soon. Oh, man. Mm. We're have to go back down and get the crackers. <laughs> It, yeah, it sounds good. like sounds like me uh, always there to crap on what <laughs> the on the great food or whatever it is. Oh, this is great. Where's the crackers? <laughs> well, uh, I think I can see Josh is still watching the video. Yeah, we no, are. All I can say is I'm glad I <laughs> ate before I started the show because had I not and I was as hungry as I was before I had eaten dinner tonight, um, mm -hmm. I would probably be getting up and leaving right now. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, all right, that's it. I'm going to the store. You know, I wish there was a way that we could uh, like have one of those things that she makes and we divide it in three well, eat and it then, here yeah and then we each have some you know as as she's doing the thing we're just eating it i guess the only way we'd be able to do that would be to use one of her recipes from nomnews uh dot, dot yeah, com and then to, and fix our, our own, own and then oh, cut this up. tastes like garbage i don't know what, <laughs> yeah. what did i do wrong we'd be like, oh my god <laughs> <laughs> you know that uh that other one that she uh that she did uh about the uh, uh corned beef bread bowl uh, that one with the meats and the cheeses and the, the sauerkraut and all you that stuff. Like really meat, cheese, and bread put together. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. Anyway, great, uh, great food segment from uh, Gina and yeah, thanks, uh, Gina. Thanks, Gina. Yeah, and again, if you uh, if you haven't visited nomnews uh, dot uh, com, please go over there and and give it a look. Uh, but get you something to chew on before you uh, <laughs> before you go over there. That's, I don't know how she takes such beautiful pictures of food. I guess the food's beautiful, is what it is. Mm hmm. The Jeep Dog Show. It's not about us. It's about you, the listeners. Hey, it's Tim from Torrance. Hey, Jeepers. This is uh, Rob from Antonio, Texas. Hey, guys. It's Cody with TrailChasers.net with another grand adventure. Hey, guys. This is Cody from Indiana. Hello, Jeep Talk Show crew. This is FJ Rick. Hi, guys. This is Joe. If a turtle doesn't have a shell, is he naked or homeless? Hey guys, this is Ron out in Arizona. Hey, hey, what's up? Jeep Talk Show. This is Jake the Northern Trail Off Road. Hi, this is Jake from California, and I'm sitting here eating pork rinds for breakfast. Hey, this is uh, PAG Free. <laughs> hey, Tony, Josh, Danny, it's like today, Jake calling. This is John, the Free Runner in 1982, and on today's radio context segment, I'm going to talk about APRS, an anal probe restraint system. No! No. No, no, that's not right. We love our listeners. <laughs> You're listening to a 4x4 four by four, four by four Radio Network Podcast. Hey, you. Yeah. No, I'm talking to you, the one listening to the Jeep Talk Show right now. We already know that you're a Jeep enthusiast, but I bet you did. I bet you know somebody who isn't into Jeeps. That's okay. We know it's not their fault, and we're not judging you for still being their friend. But there's a good chance they might like something on the 4x4 Radio Network, whether it's overlanding with the Trail Chasers podcast, learning more than you ever thought possible about Land Rovers on the Center Steer podcast, or hearing about the latest happenings in the off-road world with the 4x4 podcast, you can be sure we've got something for everyone in your life, even if they don't know the difference between a Wrangler and a Renegade. It's okay. It's the 4x4 Radio Network. It's here for everybody. Just visit 4x4radionetwork.com. Good shows over there. Really good shows. And uh, Cody's back, and uh, uh, <laughs> he's Where'd been he gone. Go? He left. He's been gone so long. Oh. No, I'm <laughs> I am brain farting. <laughs> the four by four podcast, Dan. That guy. <laughs> he the other, is the other. Cody. He has been gone so long. I have forgotten <laughs> his name. 
But uh, Dan should be coming back with some uh, some new episodes very very soon. I swear to God, Dan, I really did forget your name. That wasn't a was wasn't a, a gimmick. <laughs> All right, well, let's get over to some uh, Wrangler talk. Shut up and listen. Shut up. So shut up. You don't shut up. Shut up, Shane. Hey. Shut up and listen. It's time for Wrangler talk. It's time for G Mama. Well, hey guys. Um, you know, many owners of the Jeep Wrangler opt to get aftermarket LED headlights because they're very popular because of the headlight woes of the original manufacturer headlights on the Wranglers. Um, and back in August, I replaced my headlights with the Oxbeam headlights. Oxbeam asked me to try out their headlights, so I thought I would give it a test. Um, and while I was driving home from work the other night, I noticed one of my headlights, the driver's side, seemed to be out. And when I got out of my Jeep, this headlight was just kind of half lit for the back of a lack of better terminology. So I asked my husband to come out and um, he fixed it the professional way. He hit it with his hand and the light just came back to full light. Um, this happened another time. So I decided to hit it and it came back up again to full <laughs> light. So it hasn't done that again since. Um, but the other issue I've noticed is some flickering. It's very slight. Um, and it's only on the driver's side, which makes me wonder if I properly installed and plugged in my lights. You hit it um, hard enough. And it's just been so cold lately for me to go out and work on the lights. I guess I'm kind of wimpy. Um, and my garage is not heated. So instead, I decided to do, do some research and ask around on the internet and I've come up with four possible solutions. And the first one is to do a little detective work and swap the lights back and forth to see if the same, you know, light has the same issue on the other side. If maybe it's the wiring on one side or the other, maybe I just didn't plug it in good enough. The second would be to try what a former former auto mechanic friend suggested that I use dielectric grease i think i'm saying that properly mm -hmm. yes, um, and you apparently put this on the plug and it's supposed to help conductivity or so i'm told because i also read that the most frequent internet complaint is that this grease insulates connections making the connections less conductive um, third during my research i found that the flickering is so common among leds that I came across what's called an anti-flicker decoder. And I'm told that the flicker is because the headlight high and low beam circuits have a PWM regulation on them, which is called the pulse width modulation, which Tony brought up Tuesday night in our Jeep Talk call-in show. Anyway, this is a mode that basically pulses DC power to keep them at an average wattage. And it's not compatible with these LED headlights. So I was looking to get this anti-flicker adapter and I bought it on Amazon slash Jeep Talk Show or <laughs> Jeep Talk Show slash Amazon. Anyway, it's right here. It's um, H4 to H13 for Jeep Wrangler anti-flicker decoder. And it's supposed to fit any 7-inch round headlight systems. Um, it's apparently easy to install. You just simply peel and um, pl apply. And it's compatible with my um, headlights, supposedly. We'll see. Um, anyway, once I am, once it warms up, I'm going to try to put that in and also maybe clean up my connectors. That could possibly be a problem because I did drive in some pretty deep water. And just clean them up to make sure they're all good. But there seems to be some debate on if that's really my issue on social media sites. People are going back and forth saying what my issue could be. But if you guys have anything you'd like to add to this, I'd love to hear from you. There are tons of ways you can do that. You can email me at info at jeeptalkshow.com. Use the subject line Wrangler Talk. You can leave a message on our Jeep Talk Show website voicemail. Just go over to the right-hand side of the screen and punch that red button or you can go over to our mobile friendly site the jeeptalkform.com this is a new site we created just for you it's not your typical form there's no flaming or telling you to go to google to do your search and there are no dumb questions you can also find out more about all the other stories we talk about here on the jeep talk show 
and all the other great information we share. And that's at jeeptalkform.com. Hope to see you there. So I'm thinking that the dielectric grease, and I've never actually looked this up. It's just me thinking. Uh, the dielectric grease can be an insulator, but its uh, its goal is to keep uh, water and uh, any kind of uh, liquid d- debris, so to speak, out of the connection that right. would cause a corrosion. It's kind of supposed to protect the metal, and if the metal is more pristine, then you get better conductivity. So uh, it it probably is something, uh, and uh, I'm Josh, I'm sure you know uh, more about how to apply this. It's probably something more that you want on the entry points, uh, like where water and stuff would get into the circuit, uh, than actually on the pins itself, you know, like deep into the, the, the section. I've always put it on the contacts themselves, you can, uh, and on the, you know, kind of where the the exit points of the co- of the uh, the connector Lawrence, are. Yeah. Um, if it's a true outdoor you know connector, a sealed connector, then it's going to have rubber grommets on both sides. Now, if it doesn't and it's open, I mean, you turn that thing ninety degrees and you can see right down into the where the wire is crimped into the uh, into the pin that goes into the plug. Well, obviously that needs to be sealed up. What would you suggest, Josh? Uh, heat shrink tubing or some uh, goop in a tube or both? In fact, there you go. So uh, I, I personally, uh, Tammy, I think you have a bad headlight or a bad connection because right. because if you're hitting it and it uh, comes back on bright, uh, there's there's something not uh, not making good contact uh, somewhere. Um, but the flickering, I think, is something different. Right. Would you agree? Yeah. No. I, I think, think the, the two, freckling, two different things. The freckling is the uh, <laughs> is the pulse width modulation. Right. Yeah, that's what I've read. Which which basically means for, for you non techy folks, and I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. It's uh, turning the thing on, on, and off really, really fast. Yeah, so fast, strobing almost. Yeah, so fast yeah. you can't even see it. Now, see if you could actually do strobing. I think that'd be a lot of fun. You know, get that, <laughs> get that person out of the way. <laughs> get some color lights up in there. We're gonna have a disco. Yeah. <laughs> do the John Travolta dance. Yep, yep, that's true. All righty, well there we go. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show? What are you talking about, man? Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show? I got no idea what the heck. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Get out of my face, yo. Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Underwater. Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? In the bubble bath. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? No clue. And where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? While flexing on stumps. Where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? I would assume on the radio. The Jeep Talk Show, available on iTunes and at jeeptalkshow.com. Hey, where do you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at? We'd like to know. Give us a call at 530-675-4102 and let us know where you listen to the Jeep Talk Show at. Well, uh, I say it every week. This is uh, Tammy likes the Nikki G. I like the reviews. It tells us. Uh, uh, I don't know if I like the Nikki G. <laughs> number one. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. It's it's much like a trip to the doctor, isn't it, uh, Tammy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Josh, Josh gets that. Well, well, her last trip to the doctor. I mean, come on, <laughs> that, that's yeah. the joke. That's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, what I was going to say is, we love the reviews, and I really like hearing from from you guys. I mean, we do all the talking all the time, and it's it's wonderful hearing back from you guys, whether it's voicemails or reviews. And uh, well, we didn't get a lot of reviews this week, but we did get one. Yeah, this one's on our YouTube channel, in fact, youtube.com slash Jeep Talk Show. And uh, Aiden Vargas gave us a review one week ago. He says, crazy to see how you guys look after listening for a while. I listen to you guys on my way to work. Thanks for making my drive not so bad. Not so bad. <laughs> not so bad. <laughs> nah, we do what we can. We do what we can. That could mean we're really, really good and the, the drive to work is really, really bad. It's, that, know, that's the direction I'm a, going. If he was a talented artist, we can get some sketches of uh, you know what he thought we looked like. <laughs> right, I know. <laughs> you know, just... <laughs> <laughs> that would be entertaining, be to say the least. I just apologized to him. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, uh, Tammy and uh, Josh are the good-looking ones. I've got the face for radio. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it looks like we got something via email as well, didn't we? Yeah, from yeah. Cameron Kirkland. He wrote, hey, Jeep Talk Show. It's Cameron in Indiana. I sent you an email several months ago inquiring about tightening up the steering on my 01 Wrangler and addressing a possible death wobble issue. Josh did a great job throwing a lot of information out about the question. (laughs) However, after starting to look at these components, I realized although they might be a little worn, there were no issues with it. 
Long story short, after clicking on a random YouTube video about U-joints, I soon realized the reason my Wrangler was shaking was a bad U-joint. It bad. appeared to have been bad for a little while, and I got lucky that it had not damaged the yoke, drive shaft, and all that. I am a bit embarrassed to say that I thought I had death wobble when it really was my U-joint shaking things when I was driving. But that just goes to show you that there's always something to learn. Just wanted to give you guys an update and say I will eventually be using the info Josh gave about the steering when I start beeping things up. Thanks for the great show, Cameron. That's some bad. That's a bad U joint. Yeah, it's shaking the Jeep that bad. Lord. Yeah. Well, he, this must have been an axle U joint up front. I'm going to assume. I mean, it very well could have been a front drive shaft uh, U joint as well. Those are notorious for for producing uh, front end shaking sim uh, symptoms and stuff. But you know, nonetheless, uh, you know, we went through a lot of information on that particular segment on that show. I threw a lot of information at you, Cameron. So I'm glad that you took some of that to heart. And we're able to uh, to figure things out in the long run. So even if it wasn't indeed front end, uh, you know, actual steering related. Oh man, I just <laughs> whenever he uh, whenever I saw that, I was like, oh holy hell, that's that's really bad. I'm glad that nothing came apart on you. I'm glad yeah, you're able really. to get that thing fixed in time uh, before you had a problem. You got tech questions? Ah, oh, what do I ever? We have answers. Oh, that's good because I think it's tech talk with Jeep Wait talk. Ah, oh. Well, hey, we got this one in from email recently. It says uh, it was from Peter Newill. He wrote in and asked, hello, guys, I'm after a little advice. I'm looking at getting myself a Jeep Cherokee, but with gas costing what it does in the UK, I don't have many to choose from. I am looking at the 2.5 CRD or the 2.8 liter around 2003 to 2005. Anything bigger would just not make sense to run in the UK. My question is, are they both a strong engine, both a strong engine, and do they have cam belts or chains, and would they have lots of power for towing my 1944 GPW Jeep to shows it as driving anything over 30 miles, and, uh, driving at anything over 30 miles just a pain in the backside, literally. Yeah, I can only imagine. Well, so for all you Jeepers here in the States, if you remember abroad, the Liberty was called the Cherokee, and it was even manufactured under this name badge after 2001. But for all intents and purposes, it was still very much just the liberty that we all know here in the States. The model years extended from 2002 through 2007 and had a wide variety of engine and transmission options. For Peter's sake, though, we're going to focus on the diesels, which came in two varieties, the 2.8 liter and the 2.5 liter, especially for... Look, I'm going to recommend just right off the top here the 2.8 liter, especially if he's going to be doing any towing at all. Just disregard the 2.5 liter altogether. However, even the larger engine only gave up this little Jeep a 3,500 pound tow rating. Now, the 3.7 liters have, the 3.7 liter gasoline engines have way more horsepower and came with a 5,000 pound tow rating, which is odd because the CRDs have over 60 foot pounds more torque. So it makes them a little bit more of a, uh, a towing vehicle, I would say. Now, the, uh, the motor that he's looking at, the 2.8 liters, the Via Motori 2.8 liter inline four, uh, it has a common rail injection, is usually backed by Chrysler's 545 RFE automatic transmission. Uh, it was rated about 160 horsepower at 3,800 RPM, and it has a decent rating of 295 foot-pounds at 1,800 RPM. Nice and solid grunt way down low. Now, some early models were dealer D-rated 260 foot-pounds, but this really wasn't fully confirmed. So, you know, I'd say you're pretty good no matter what. EPA estimated fuel economy 19 to 24, uh, you know, highway with being average around 18 or so, depending on how you drive. And the short-lived Liberty CRD was only offered for the 05 and 06 model years. And due to emissions regulations, it wasn't even sold in California and New York, two most populated states. Now, despite the short production run and admits many car experts giving them less than satisfactory reviews, the people still loved the diesels and Chrysler sold every single unit it produced. There were a few recalls for these, nothing really major, lower ball, point, ball joints were on this list, an easy fix. The most severe recall was for the torque converter. The original lockup clutch was weak and prone to failure, causing audible rattling and eventual transmission failure if not corrected. Mopar fixed this and offered a direct replacement. If you were in the know, you could request a Mopar European spec unit as an upgrade or go after market with a Suncoast converters upgrade. Either way, a big improvement over the original. Either way, I'd make sure that the vehicle you're getting, Peter, has been into a service center for this recall specifically. Timing belt water pumps are about the only other big issues on these, but these are parts that are expected to go out with age, and once done, they're good for another 100,000 miles. Lowest maintenance cost of just about any Jeep on average, about $346 per year. Now, the other complaints I've read are pretty minor in the grand scheme of things. The navigation systems has a 
a small screen and they're not very easy to use, but once you get past the learning curve, eh, it's ultimately not so bad. And that there could be some turbo lag in the engine and once it, unless it's up to proper temps, meaning that it could seem sluggish or unresponsive if you're trying to accelerate quickly when the engine is cold. And the other issues, which are basically just opportunities for upgrades, are the EGR system getting fouled up, the intake gets too dirty, and the fuel economy, economy plummets. The fix for this is a modified ECU, which disables the EGR and adds some serious performance. The other common issues are cracking or chapping of the intercooler hoses. And this is because the OEM hoses don't have a silicone lining. Pure silicone aftermarket hoses give long-lasting peace of mind and are an upgrade, and oh, they just plain look cool. The fuel water separator system can eventually develop leaks, but the good news is the Mopar has an upgraded version of this, complete with a wiring harness, making it easy for the do-it-yourself to swap out. All in all, the 2.8-liter common rail diesel engine is not only reliable, but efficient and powerful, too. So long as you're not towing a lorry or a 40-foot caravan on holiday, Peter, I'd say you're okay for towing that 1944 Jeep, which has a curb weight of about 2,500 pounds. So as long as you don't have a heavy equipment box, or a heavy equipment trailer, or a box trailer, well, then you should be just fine toting that little 44 willies around to shows that, well, what have you. Peter, I hope this has helped you with your decisions for a CR Jeep. As always, keep in mind that not every seller is going to be 100% honest. So having a professional mechanic give you the final word might be worth the uh, few quid for some peace of mind, if you know what I'm saying. And hey, Jeepers, let me know if you guys have a tech question you would like answered here on the show. Just go to jeeptalkforum.com. Even on your smartphone, it is friendly there. Or shoot me an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com with the subject line, Tech Talk. I like how you threw that quid thing in there, like it's an everyday word that you use. <laughs> 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 oh man i wish we had some diesel problems around here you know oh this diesel's a piece of crap but i like this diesel engine oh, which is much man. better you know i just i just hate the rds that. out here in the states are extremely rare they mm -hmm. did not send a lot of them over here and they didn't make a whole lot of them over here so um there was I, i've seen one out here in the northwest ever so what's, and it, yeah it's been that rare yeah. so it's, it's very rare what's to find a CR, crd jeep out here um, it may be different elsewhere in the States, maybe just a, North, a Northwest thing. I don't know. But Peter, if you can find yourself a nice clean 2.8 liter with the, that's perhaps maybe the trail rated trim level or the limited, those are the only two trim levels that I would recommend. The sport's pretty trimmed down from all of that. And it might be hard to find a 2.8 liter in the sport trim anyway. So you're going to be after a decent Jeep, it's just be a matter of getting the right Jeep at the right price for your needs. But I think with everything considered, you're going to be looking at the right vehicle for your needs. So Tammy, I think uh, Tammy had a great question that some of our uh, uh, listeners may not uh, know the answer to. Mm -hmm. What's the big deal about diesels? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. um, diesels are notoriously known for having far more torque than a gasoline engine, uh, okay. and they can produce that torque way down low in the RPM range, which is really ideal for off-roading. We have right. you know that low-range transfer case and everything like that. Not to mention, uh, diesel generally has a little bit better fuel economy mm -hmm. uh, than gasoline. And historically, diesel was cheaper uh, than gasoline for many, many decades. And now it's, they're pretty close. Yeah. Uh, I think that they're, they're not selling as much in the States. And uh, they're trying to soak the 18-wheelers uh, 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 with, uh, you know, trying to get the, the profits up by uh, charging the 18-wheelers more for, for the diesel fuel. And also, yeah. too, the fun thing about diesels is you can run it on French fries. Oh yeah, biodiesel oil. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, oh, okay. you can do modifications to it. So uh, to the and not the much really. Yeah. That's that's the that's the key thing there is is to run start running biodiesel in a CRD Jeep. It doesn't take a lot. The kits out there are relatively inexpensive, and you know you got to have a decent uh, set of hand tools to make the modifications. But you know once it's done, yeah, you go down the road, and the people behind you are starting start thinking McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, of course, I remember watching uh, an extreme. Uh, I think it was extreme. Uh, uh, I think it was extreme. extreme four by four? And, yeah, yeah I think it was extreme four. and not uh, not trucks. But anyway, uh, they actually had to put a heater on the uh, the vegetable oil, the, the oh, French fry oil, to keep it from solidifying and right. stuff. Right? Didn't you know it? And and they had to do it because uh, you can't have it solidifying the the fuel lines either. So uh, they actually had a, a little kit that they put in there so that whenever you went to turn the diesel off, it would run for a, a predetermined length of time. It would switch to the diesel fuel 
run for a predetermined length of time so that all the fuel from the tank would be the diesel fuel and then it would shut off that way oh, if wow. it, it, you wouldn't have this congealing yeah. uh this uh, uh heart attack type uh <laughs> cholesterol packing the the fuel lines uh type thing it was very interesting i just uh, other than you know that would kind of suck but the whole idea about just pulling up to a mcdonald's uh, especially when fill her when, up. Yeah, when fuel was like four bucks, right. uh, four bucks a gallon or something. And is this the idea of running on uh, old French fry oil was pretty cool. Uh, but uh, I guess it'll be a number of years before we uh, before we're looking at uh, any diesels, any uh, significant number of diesels in this country. Yeah, that's it. Are you tired of all that noise from those other shows? Darryl, I think you ought to keep that rig Darryl. at the mall. Now you can relax to the pleasing tones of the Jeep Talk Show every Unless week. Unless you got Dana 60s and 40. Get the highest audio quality possible with each download. Now, you know, you can use them in with them, with them super swampers. And if you're tired of all that other stuff. Uh, and a thing with the tech, big old tires and a lot of Then subscribe to the highest quality podcast on the web. The Jeep Talk Show. Available on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher Radio, and more. You guys, you need to give me a beer. <laughs> hey, folks, you know, we love hearing from every one of you. So please call our voicemail line at 530-675-4102. Or like I said earlier, jump over to our website at jeeptalkshow.com and leave us a message. All you need to do is click on the leave voicemail button on the right hand side of the screen. Hey, this is Tony. And I'm Tammy. And this is Josh. And you've reached our 24-7 voicemail line. You guys know what to do, so at the beep, leave your message. Hey, guys, it's Goose. Um, I just listened to the show, and I I, uh, I looked at what you were talking about, Josh. I wanted to let you know. Um, I looked into it, and that, that's actually the kind of locker that I have in the front right now. It's, the, um, it's, a, it's an automatic-style locker. From what I'm seeing, the Yukon Grizzly locker, it's, it's one of those ones that has uh, the, uh, the, plain, the plain cut deep to where they can skip over each other as you differentiate through a turn. And uh, that's actually what I'm running in the Jeep right now in the front. And like I said, I love the way those are. It is bulletproof. Um, I never want for traction. It gives me such great traction. It's just... I want to get away from that. I guess that's what they call it is the uh, lunchbox style or the ratcheting style locker where it skips the tooth as you go through a turn. Um, and yeah, they are substantially cheaper. And um, also for Tony, uh, I looked into what you were saying about um, it being the flick of a switch for the uh, ARV and you, you like the simplicity of it into prevent somebody or something from hitting the switch or from messing it up, how could you prevent that? Um, I looked into that as well. I actually called Ox and I asked them how, what they've done, what would they do to prevent an accidental engagement of a locker on concrete. And what they said is with their mechanical levers, you can actually screw the top down to lock it in place to where... If you want to engage the locker, you almost have to engage it like um, like if you were squeezing a syringe. You put two fingers underneath and then a thumb on top, and you lift up a locking collar that will allow you to rotate the, or to slide it back into the on position. What you can do is you can screw the knob down, and you can make it where you can't lift that collar up. So if somebody else was to drive my Jeep or drive somebody's Jeep that has a hot locker, you just tighten that down and you tell them don't touch it. You know, and that's the same thing, you know, with your, with your ARB. You tell them don't touch the compressor switch, don't touch that blue switch. <laughs> but um, thanks, guys. I really appreciate y'all's input. I hope y'all are having a good one. And uh, my Jeep's going to be, it's going to be turned into a, a, uh, a weekend where you're, uh, I drive it, you know, sometimes if I just feel like it or with all the snow, I drive it, but um, it's going to become a weekend where you're in 48 and 37. So that's what the lockers are coming in for. All right, y'all keep keeping. I'll see y'all later. Bye. So Thanks, Goose. I'll just mention that uh, when Jeep uh, goes to put lockers in a, a factory Jeep, they use switches. They don't use mechanical levers. 
And I, I see there's absolutely nothing wrong with an aux lock, locker. Love it. I love the idea of the mechanical cable and the, you know, you move that lever, you know, it's engaged, but if you're not the only one driving it, it's going to be a problem. I do have to make one small correction. Goose, the, uh, the, the Grizzly lockers are a full case locker. You, they're not a lunchbox locker, mm. even though the internals of them operate like a lunchbox locker. Um, they, they're kind of a combination between your lunchbox and a, and a full spool giving you the ability to, you know, for the differential halves to overrun each other, um, but still while giving you 100% reliable and bulletproof engagement, full traction. I mean, like you said, they they are, you know, absolutely bulletproof and traction is reliable, but the Grizzly ones are a full case locker, meaning that you have to separate that ring gear from the carrier uh, in order to, you know, to do this installation. So um, look into them a little bit. Don't discount them all together. Um, they, trust me, I've seen these things in action and, and I would definitely, if I had the money to throw at a differential like that, I would definitely be going grizzly. You know, uh, talking about having other people drive your, uh, your capable off-road vehicle. Uh, I was, and I think goose is actually the one that sent me the link to the YouTube video where they were describing various lockers. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I may be saying this wrong or I just have it all wrong altogether, but I think it's a torsion, torsion, uh, type locker. Um, basically it is an automatic locker, but the way it works with the worm gears, meshing worm gears and, uh, not worm gears, I forget what it's called. Uh, it, uh, it basically, uh, works like a, um, uh, a select, not a selectable locker. It kind of works as Limited a slip kind of, yeah, yeah. Type, type deal. And, uh, the thing that, that clued me on it being a good idea was they're used in the military, uh, H1 Hummers. And if they ever got a wheel up in the air, well, the, the limitation to this type of locker is it still sends the power to the wheel with the least amount of traction. And all the, the soldier would have to do is press on the brake. Hmm. And then they would get moving forward because it will switch to the other wheel. And I thought, this is great. I mean, this is really simple. And, it, you know, like, like you say, keep it simple, stupid. And when you're out on the, the field of battle or driving through five, five o'clock traffic, that's not a bad thing to do. Of course, if you're in five o'clock traffic and you got a wheel in the air, I, <laughs> that's a good yeah, drive. I, I need, uh, I need to commute sign. with. <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting drive. <laughs> But at least it doesn't, uh, you don't have any levers or switches or anything to mess with. Anyway, great information, and uh, we look forward to hearing more in the future about uh, how you proceed with your uh, your Jeep. Well, let's get over to Stephen in Arkansas, and I think this is uh, Stephen's first call into our show. Right on. Hi, Jeep Talk Show. This is Stephen, Arkansas. I called in wanting information and insights on buying a used Jeep. Um, right now, I have a... Cadillac 05 DeVille that gets about three miles to the gallon. It needs to go away. I'm looking for a Jeep for utility to haul trailers and be able to work around the house and have a um, Jeep so we can have an easier time camping and um, maybe do some overlanding while the kids are so small. It would definitely be a daytime, daily commuter. And I wouldn't mind, you know, putting good lift and some nice little extras on it to make it more usable and more fun. I really love your podcast. Listen to it all the time. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I uh, I misheard that. I thought it was Stephen in Arkansas. It's Steve in Arkansas. <laughs> uh. Well, you know, nothing says uh, <laughs> nothing says cruising like a Cadillac. And uh, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe you could just find you a nice uh, uh, frame uh, and uh, four wheel drive uh, uh, lower portion and just put that Cadillac on top of the <laughs> on top of the four by four frame. They, they've done stranger things. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is is pretty cool. Uh, I don't know. I think, um, you know, I say go cheap and, um, you know, get the 4.0. Like I, I love the 4.0. I don't, I do not like the, the engines that came, uh, after that. And, uh, I, frankly, I don't really care for the engines that were around at the same time that Jeep were using because they're just not as, uh, as, as good as the, uh, the 4.0. So, uh, I would say uh, Wrangler or uh, Cherokee XJ, but if you're going to do overlanding, you're going to need the room. So you're kind of. I was just going to say you need space to pack all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're, I keep kind of limited to JKU or the XJ. 
I keep going back to a Grand Cherokee for Steve. Oh, um, yeah, you know, he's got a family and stuff. Um, he, he, you know, daytime commuter and stuff. Now, I don't know how long your commute is, Steve. I don't know. I mean, obviously, you're going to be getting better gas mileage even in a Grand Cherokee than you are in the <laughs> Caddy right now. So, you know, that's going to be a step up in the right direction. But you're used to cut size and comfort. So, you know, granted, the XJ definitely came in a limited, you know, with leather seats and all that stuff. But I'd say get, step up to the Grand Cherokee and even go up into like the WJs or, or even the next generation. I don't know what your budget is um, right now. So, you know, that's another hard, hard way to, to point you in the right direction. But, um, but really, the, the, you know, late 90s to early 2000s Grand Cherokees can be had for a song and a dance right now. Some of them even had a four or uh, had the 4.7 mm-hmm. liter engine, which was a decent engine. Uh, there's a ton of aftermarket support for them. Your gas mileage isn't going to be awesome, you know, compared to like a four liter engine, um, like what you get in a Wrangler or something like that. But unless you're stepping up into something like a JKU, well, then you're going to be talking, a, you know, a whole different ball game and a whole different kind of budget as well. So, um, you know, again, Steve, I'm not sure what your budget is and I'm not sure what your mechanical ability is either. But, you know, either platform, uh, either JKU or the Grand Cherokee, the lift kits are going to be relatively the same kind of cost and component layout. So, you know, either way, you're going to be getting the same kind of performance. It's just going to be a matter of what your budget is, uh, sort of, and, and what kind of feel you're looking for. So hop on Craigslist, get a hold of a few people, get out there and test drive a few different Grand Cherokees, test drive a couple few different, you know, uh, four-door uh, uh, Wranglers, and, and see what fits best for your driving style and what, you know, what the seat of the pants meter feels like for you. And you're probably going to be, uh, for the overlanding, you're probably going to be wanting to look into either building a inexpensive uh, roof rack or uh, maybe mm-hmm. also finding a roof rack on uh, Craigslist. You know, we need to uh, we need to do a little work and uh, start coming up with some off land, uh, off landing, off <laughs> some uh, overlanding stuff uh, for the show. Uh, I know we've got lots of listeners out there that are very interested in overlanding and um, we could start with what the hell do is like overlanding? A, an overlanding 101, you know, type yeah. of, you know these yeah. are going to be the serious, most, you know, top 10 considerations for building an overlanding vehicle, you know, something like that. Yeah. Space type thing is, is the main thing. It's, uh, I guess you can do it in a Wrangler, uh, two door Wrangler, sure. but, uh, you would, you just uh, need to ut- utilize your space. You wouldn't be bringing the family with you. That's for no. sure. <laughs> Not unless they were riding in the trailer behind you, <laughs> which don't do that. Cause I think it's uh, illegal. All right. Well, uh, let's see. I'm going to start this segment off by. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start this segment off by uh, Tammy. Start counting backwards from 100. <laughs> um, seriously, um, something we look forward to each and every week because you just never know what's going to come out of his mouth, and that's hearing from the mind of Nikki G. <laughs> from the mind of Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G, and I uh, just passed the Jeep dealership and saw all the Renegades out there in their nice, new, fancy colors like the red, the greens, the yellows, and stuff. And it kind of looked like a giant bag of Skittles was spilt. <laughs> <laughs> but it got me thinking. I haven't really made a New Year's resolution this year, so I'm going to make one now. I I'm going to resolve... To not hate on the Jeep colors. I'm not going to give in to the black versus red fight anymore. I'm just going to accept all Jeeps as they are. <laughs> Except for the black ones with the uh, primer defenders. Nah, I changed my mind. I'll, I'll even love on those. And I'll extend it out to uh, non-Jeeps too. Hondas, Toyotas, Nissans. If you have a vehicle and you love it, then uh, I'll accept it. So that's my New Year's resolution. And I also uh, resolve to stay off the internet (laughs) until at least Time Warner uh, renews my service. Uh, Apparently, they don't accept poultry as a form of payment. They should have had that in the small print on the bill, but they didn't. So it's uh, their mistake. They keep blaming it on me, but it's their mistake. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> you never know what to expect, do you? Do you? It was tender chicken, you know, legal tender. Ah, oh, nicely done. <laughs> Speaking of nicely done, we've been uh, telling you guys that uh, Nate, YJ Nate from uh, our Wrangler Extreme segment was going to be uh, teaching us about axles. 
And, uh, well, we've got uh, the first uh, installment of uh, axles tonight. I think we're going to learn about some of the terms that are being used for axles, so we'll know better what to expect, uh, you know, what Nate's talking about in the upcoming episodes. Now, remember, this is a series, so you need to be listening each and every week so you don't miss any of it. Hey Jeep Enthusiasts, this is Nate with another edition of Wrangler Extreme. I wanted to cover a couple of common differential and axle terms so that uh, you folks could be familiar with a couple of terms I'm going to use in some upcoming segments. So here goes. So the main component of your axle is the housing, and at the center of that housing is the actual differential. The differential is responsible for basically getting the power that comes in from your drive shaft 90 degrees out to the two axle shafts in whatever configuration your axle set up for. Uh, differentials can be open, which means one tire gets... Uh, uh, power at a, at a time, and, or they could be locked, or they could be spooled, or they could be selectable lockers, or limited slip, and all of those are a little outside of what I'm going to describe today. Just know that they exist. The next thing is spider gears and side gears. Now, in an open differential, and probably other differentials as well, uh, if you were to open up the cover on your, your axle housing and just look at the carrier that was in there, You'll see four gears, one on top, one on bottom, one on each side. The side gears, or of course the side, the, the gears that are on the sides. That's where your axle shafts come in, and that's how the power gets to the axle shafts. The spider gears are at the top and the bottom, and they look kind of like spiders, which is why they're called that. The next is a C-clip. So the C-clip is sometimes used at the end of the axle shaft uh, on the inside of the spider gear. Axle shaft comes through the side gear and the C-clip goes onto this little nub on the end of the shaft. Next is high pinion versus low pinion. So if you've ever looked at an axle and you see that the input yoke is at the sort of bottom half of the, the differential housing, that's a low pinion. If the input yoke is at the top of the housing, that's a high pinion. So leading into that is reverse cut gears versus standard cut gears. You may have heard this term before, especially when referring to front axles or high pinion axles. So the ring and pinion gear inside of your your differential have the, 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 the face on the teeth of the gears is designed to carry the load on one side and to coast on the other side. In a reverse cut, those are cut reverse so the load side is on the opposite side of the of the the tooth the, the teeth on the gear uh, this is great for high pinion axles or front axles because it puts the load on the proper side of the teeth okay next is spline count you've probably heard this almost interchangeably with the strength of an axle shaft uh, the, the splines are essentially the the teeth on the end of an axle shaft, which make it mate to the the carrier in the center of your your uh, your differential. Uh, the spline count goes up with a thicker diameter shaft. So the thicker the shaft, usually the stronger the shaft is. Also, the heavier it is. This all depends on what material your shafts are made out of. And we'll be following up with uh, more uh, axle. Uh, I think we have another uh, explanation of the various terms and axles for next week, and uh, then we'll be getting into the uh, the meat of uh, the various axles and what you should be able to expect from them. And I'll I'll just jump uh, jump ahead a bit and let you know that if you've got a Dana thirty five, it could literally explode on you at any moment. Just sitting in the driveway, it could it could blow up. Hey, I knew what spline count was. Yeah, excellent. See, some of this stuff's rubbing off on you. Yeah. Yeah, you should. Have, but surely, you should have uh, quite a quite a good uh, 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 spline count on your uh, um, Rubicon there, Tammy. So uh, you shouldn't have to worry about that. At least not for a few years. All right. Well, let's get over to some uh, must-have stuff for your Jeep. I wanted to say Jeep stuff for your Jeep. That'd be a lot of Jeep. <laughs> too much Jeep. Never too much. Jeep. Mm-mm. Well, we've been seeing a lot more of these like recovery boards or yeah. traction mats on roof racks and the back of off-road vehicles and stuff. They're oftentimes a fluorescent color. I've seen them in red even, Tony. There you go. Well, it was only a matter of time before somebody came up with a better mousetrap, so to speak, and in, 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 into the scene, lift tracks. Now, these are a little bit expensive, anywhere from about $250 to $300, depending on which option you go with. Uh, and 
even if you're experienced off-roader, trust me, guys, you can still sometimes find yourself stuck in a situation where you could use a little more lift or a little more traction or maybe even both. Lift Tracks, lift Tracks off-road recovery device offers both in a rollable, portable, inflatable package. That's right. I said rollable, portable, and inflatable. These ultra-rugged air mats feature a flexible outer shell covered in rubber grips, which, which, which offer traction in nearly any condition to vehicles weighing up to 8,800 pounds, letting you get on with your adventure no matter what sort of 4x4 you're driving. So imagine, if you will, not having to take up all that space with a four-foot plank of plastic, right? Now, these things roll up, and it, the, the storage is, I mean, geez, I think recovery strap probably takes up more storage than these things do. So, in uh, inflatable, well, you know, come on, we're all carrying air pumps and stuff, and we all got lungs, so inflate these things very, very easily. Very good traction device here. I would say definitely one of the best traction devices that I've seen come on the market in recent years. So, if you've, uh, well, if you've got the money and you're looking for a traction device to add in the recovery kit, check out Lift Tracks. So you know what the uh, I've seen like during Christmas time a few people that I've I follow on Facebook got those uh, uh, plastic uh, yeah uh, deals. Yeah, do you have any idea what those things cost? They're pretty expensive well, too, aren't they? They can be. Now I've seen them run for as little as twenty five bucks. Oh, I gotta um, get one. But you know, hey, I I don't know if you're gonna really trust the weight of your vehicle on those or not. I'm I'm not gonna say you get what you pay for in these because honestly, I haven't vetted a lot of these, so I don't know. But I can't imagine that the twenty five dollar version is going to be you know as comparable as the ones that you see for about two hundred, which is about the mean price. Smitty Built, I think, has a version for about 150 to 199 that you can get, um, but they're usually about 200 to 250 for you know the mo- most the majority of the ones that I've seen, anyways. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm looking at the picture that we have in our yeah. notes. To me, it looks like a a rock crawling cheater thingy. Well, Bobber. yeah, it, the, the picture cheater. that we have would be um, you, we would all look at that and just be like, well, I can roll over that in right. two-wheel drive, you know. Uh, it's more for, I think, you know, just visual representation. Now, obviously, you know, what we're talking about here doesn't make good radio. Um, the the demonstration picture that we're talking about here shows the product in use, um, going, uh, kind of leaning up against a rock that you would say maybe about twice this tall as a curb. And I would say, yeah. uh, hey, you need to wipe them feet before you put that uh, tire <laughs> on my pillow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. really. <laughs> so, you know, I, whether or not these things can actually handle up to 8,800 pounds of vehicle sitting on top of them, I don't know. That's what they're rated for. So I would imagine they would have to. Um, and of course, you can vary the, the, the inflation to, um, you know, compensate for whatever kind of terrain or, or you're on or what kind of traction needs you have. So the versatility aspect of these certainly is more attractive than these large plastic, uh, you know, sheets that people are carrying around. So I got this buddy that uh, quite often goes on uh, uh, weekend wheeling trips, and he always forgets his pillow. Do you think that there could be an accessory for like a, a pillowcase or something uh, for this? You sir, <laughs> now you're using the old noodle. Yeah, I, I could, I could very easily imagine seeing uh, just throwing a uh, you know a nice heavy pillowcase over one of these things and and uh, using it as an emergency pillow uh, for those times where your uh, podcast host forgets his pillow when you, camping. You know, you don't want you make sure you put a pillowcase on that because with all that rubber on there, you'd have half the your half your hair oh, left yeah. on it when you sweat you turned at night. Oh. Ow. <laughs> ah! i thought you'd enjoy that josh <laughs> hey folks we have a survey on our website that we want you just to take a moment to fill out it's really simple and easy it's just to give us a little bit of information on who's out there listening to us and that's at jeeptalkshow.com slash survey S-U-R-B-E-Y. Yeah, we'd like to hear from you guys, and uh, don't worry about uh, the information. Nobody will uh, use that information unless you don't fill it out that we're coming to your house. So uh, if you guys want, uh, we're, we're right at the one-hour mark. We can do a, a quick campfire side chat if you guys would like to hit your I would say topics. Let's, uh, let's skip that. for let's, I want to get into this wheeling wear a little bit. All right. Well, let's uh, jump over to wheeling wear. Then uh, just remember, Josh is the one that canceled campfire side chat. I wanted to do it. Wow. Well, <laughs> well, you didn't have anything we, written. Well, you know, I wanted I to give you guys to. an opportunity to talk. I mean, well, Josh guys, says that he moved his Jeep. That was the thing I was most interested in hearing about. But. That's that's well, you know, I mean, that's I guess right. because the wheeling wear event is uh, isn't until June, we've got some time that we can talk yeah. about. It. I was just excited about uh, the involvement. Well, but, if, uh, if I guilt a G into it, uh, that's fine. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, Josh, but no, come on. Yeah, I, but I moved the Jeep. You know, uh, there there was uh, some other mechanical things that that, that took priority over uh, getting the the wheeler up and going again. Mm-hmm. So I um I had to do the uh, the car shuffle, which uh, was about an hour of shoveling and dethawing of vehicles and whatnot, oh, and uh, finally. <laughs> Finally got things enough to where I could actually move the cars, and so once that point was uh, was set up, then I could throw the spark plugs back in the Jeep, throw the intake back together, uh, charge oh up the batteries, and, and start it up. And uh, and lo and behold, it did start up once I got the firing order correct because <laughs> I got it wrong the first time again. It's on the intake, so. Josh. <laughs> so uh, right, I don't have an intake anymore. Um, but, uh, uh, it started up and ran very rough as it as was expected in its current condition, but, uh, pulled it out and, and, uh, just kind of drove it right out in front of the house here, um, around in the snow a little bit, which was kind of fun. And, and we have some new neighbors across the street. I uh, just bought the house across from me and, uh, uh, they kind of came peeking out the windows. What's all <laughs> what that? What the racket? hell is that yeah. Billy doing? <laughs> He's really driving loud. in his yard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't park in the yard. I'm not that much of a redneck, but uh, I, oh, have, I have. No, but uh, no, it was uh, it was just to get the Honda into the garage because it desperately needed a brake job, and and uh, and so it was, you know, once the brake job was done, it was a, a a nice little cleanup job in the garage, which was also needed, and uh, and the Jeep was pulled back in. Now I did have it backed in before because if you remember. Uh, back when all this happened, I didn't know exactly what kind of condition that the engine was going to be in. I didn't know if I was going to have to get a cherry picker in there and and start pulling an engine. And I wanted the Jeep to be oh, able to yeah. be accessible in order to do this. And so it was backed into the garage. Um, but now it is, it is since I know the condition of the engine, um, it is uh, it is nose in and uh, ready to go. Gotcha. All right, Tammy, well, uh, tell us what you got. Um, well, just something... Um I don't know if, if this is normal or not. Um, Probably I guess not. it is. But um, <laughs> when um, the temperatures got really, really cold, my PSI went down like mm-hmm. six PSIs. And I was like, oh my gosh, do I need to put more air in the tires? And my 17 year old told me, no, don't, because it's going to come back up once it warms up. And it did. Um, they're back up to normal. But um, I don't know if. You know, folks out there, out there would know that that you should just leave it, right? Is that correct? Uh, I would not drive on. Uh, well, you said six psi, but I, in your notes it says twenty. No, no, it 29. went down. It went down. Oh, a total of six psi. Yeah, a total of six. Yeah, yeah that's not that big a deal. I mean, if it, it went down lower than that, then I certainly wouldn't drive on uh, the road with the, the tire pressure being too low. But yeah, I mean, as we as we remember from our science classes, uh, as uh, uh, molecules get uh, colder, they stop vibrating as much, and in air, it takes up less space. Right. So that means that the the PSI will go down. And uh, it also means that while you're uh, driving down the highway and the, the tires heat up, the PSI will increase because the air inside the tires right. is heating, and the molecules get further apart, increasing the pressure. So you don't need no. to fill them up, let the air out, fill them up, let the air out. This depends just... on how much it is. Right. Well, I mean, most tires are rated for a cold inflation pressure. I mean that that's that's what the the number on the side of the tire is for is 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 that's the PSI that it's supposed to be at when the tire is cold. Now, obviously, if you let's say you pull into a service station, you're on a road trip or something like that, you take a quick measure of the air pressure in the tires. Well, they're going to be hot, you know. So you you know that's going to be a little bit different than what your cold inflation. You're going to actually want to put in about four pounds more than what you would when the tire is hot because as it cools down, well, that tire is going to, that air pressure, like Tony was talking about, the molecules are going to contract and you're going to have a little bit less air pressure in it until it comes back up to temperature. But remember, that could be several miles of driving before that rubber heats up enough to heat up the air pressure enough to increase the actual air pressure inside the tire. I mean, as long as you're in a safe uh, air pressure range so it doesn't damage the tire... I mean, we're right, four, right. five, six PSI. That's not the end of the world. Now we're talking into 10, 12, 15 yeah. pounds. That's a whole nother ball game. Right, right. We're, we're just picking nits here for, to be talking. Uh, it's not anything you should worry about. And also, um, I broke out the Jamic, tested it out and folks need to stay tuned. I'm going to have a review on the Jamic soon. Jamic being a, a hammock for your Jeep Wrangler. Okay. 
I was thinking of some jam- pajamas. Jammies? With some sort no, of- the jammock. Okay, Did okay. I say it right? Yeah, I'm it's a really jammock. I'm really glad jammock. you didn't go with the banana hammock version of that. <laughs> Whatever. I don't. Ah, um, oh, you know me. I don't do stuff And you know like you that. can even use the jammock in the wintertime. Yes, you can. And uh, you Yeah, can, we've seen pictures of it recently, in fact. Yeah. You can uh, you can use it while playing basketball, but we, yeah, we didn't. Yeah, we could. Did we? No. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get over to the, the much anticipated, the much uh, wanted to do uh, oh, wheeling wear. This forever, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this is normally where we talk about what events are coming up in your neck of the woods and around the nation. And guys, this is the time of year when clubs and parks start planning their yearly schedules. Trust me, I, I know a lot about this sort of stuff. So setting the dates for events and fundraisers, all that stuff, it happens early and often. So whatever else in nutty off roaders are planning for, we need one to get the word out. And why don't you guys let the Jeep Talk Show help you get the word out? For you. Something that was coming up this spring, well, let us know. How about that yearly event your local club or off-road parts store is always putting on? Let us know, and we're going to get the word out to our tens of thousands of listeners. Last year, we helped dozens of Jeep clubs and off-road groups raise awareness for their event or cause. So don't let 2017 be a lackluster year, Jeepers. Send me your calendars now, and we'll be sure to give everyone plenty of notice. And in fact, we got one here recently, and uh, this one actually Tammy let us know about, and she's planning on going to this event. Now, it's like I said earlier, it's not going to happen until June, but guys, this is what I was talking about. We just started talking about this last week about um, you know off-road parks and stuff like that and uh, different Jeep clubs and, and off-road clubs having these events coming up. These guys have already planned an event for June, and this is Crawling for Cops. And obviously, this is something that we're going to be able to get behind uh, so Crawling for Cops 2017, June 2nd through June 4th. Put it on your calendars right now. It's going to be in Roush Creek, guys. So, you know, Tammy's going to be there. She's actually talking about going. Tickets for sale over at NFG Off-Road, which stands for No F's Given. Uh, so, <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, <laughs> I really like that. So uh, yeah, good job on that, guys. Uh, they also have a Facebook page set up for that. And we'll have the links in our show notes. So I heard that uh, for this crawling for cops, that actually the 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 tires on all the off road vehicles will be decorated as donuts. Yeah, and I heard that they are going to be issuing speeding tickets for anybody going over seven miles per hour. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, which won't be me, as you all, all know. <laughs> All right. Well, if you are watching us on YouTube, we want you to know that the Jeep Talk Show is also available in audio-only format. Great for listening uh, listening to while commuting or while working on your Jeep. Subscribe via iTunes, TuneIn, Google Play, or iHeartRadio and never miss an episode. Hey, speaking of subscribing, you can now subscribe with your money. Yeah, you can contribute directly to the show via PayPal. Just go to JeepTalkShow.com and look for the little orange button that says subscribe. You can uh, pick an annual subscription from $12 all the way up to like, I don't know, a 52 gazillion billion or something terawatts something. one billion dollar <laughs> and uh, you can cancel at any time if you don't subscribe we appreciate you taking time to listen to our show and did you know it can take up to four days for your favorite podcast episode to show up on apple itunes it's true itunes is a great free service and we appreciate apple for all their hard work but we want our listeners to get the jeep talk show as quickly as possible That's why we are recommending that all of you iTunes users subscribe to our podcast. No multi-day delay. You'll get the newest episodes much quicker. Open up iTunes, search for the Jeep Talk Show, and hit that subscribe button and never miss a great, funny, and informative podcast again. That's right. Hey, speaking of subscriptions, guys, you know that I like cookies more than anybody else, except for possibly Tony. And for every 100 subscriptions, well, he gets himself a cookie. So make sure you head over to youtube.com slash Jeep Talk Show and hit that subscribe button, too. Join the Jeep Talk Show team. We're looking for volunteers to manage our vast social media presence on the web. (laughs) <laughs> you can be the Jeep Talk Show's social media voice. Send an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com and find out more. That's right, guys. And well, <gasps> that's it for this week, guys. Wherever you're reeling, if you pack it in, make sure you pack it out. Let's leave our outdoor recreation spots in as good, if not better condition than they were when we arrived. Remember to always tread lightly, stand designated trails, and don't wheel where you're not supposed to. If you'd like to learn more about the Tread Lightly principles and how you can help keep our trails above the lands open for off-road use, head over to www.treadlightly.org. Yeah. Oh, and a little little teaser here. Uh, we have, uh, we're working on a new segment for the show called, uh, what is it, Josh? Uh, can you stump Josh? Uh, yeah, something along those lines, guys. If you got a tech question a jeep related question or anything that you think that might stump me well call into the anything? show 530-675-4102 and see if you can stump josh jeep related tammy oh <laughs> hey folks and um follow me on my jeep journey over at my blog at www.jeepmama.com 
Do we still need to say WW anymore these days? I, I, I just throw it in there because it. saying WWW really fast sounds kind of cool. Yeah. No plug, Josh? Oh, yeah. Well, you find me at the <laughs> voiceofjosh.com. I just, uh, the music was fading out. I didn't. Yeah, time to go. <laughs> It's hard to go. Let's get out of here. You know what we ought to do some some night is uh, let the music uh, trail out like that, and this just do another hour. <laughs> <laughs> Jump right back into another. Yeah, show. I'll be snoring. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> Can we keep Tammy up past her yeah. bedtime? All right, you guys have a great Jeep week. Uh, we'll see you Tuesday, yeah. and uh, you know Tammy and I are. We forgot to even plug the. Uh, I know we're so bad. At I got to put that in the sh- the show notes that we copy from, but. Oh, yeah. Uh, spot. Yeah, I, well, it may be there. I may have I may have jumped over it. I do that from time to time. But anyway, the uh, the Jeep Talk call in show every Tuesday night, eight p.m. Central Time, and we're going to start having guests. Tammy and I got to get on the stick. I uh, created a a document and uh, sent it to everybody. We're going to start uh, contacting these folks and scheduling up for uh, for guests, and we may actually have one on for next week. That's that's our goal, right, Tammy? It is, and we uh, the plan is. Um, well, the question was. Um, motor oil but if we have a, a guest well we can ask the guests what do they think about yeah. motor oil are they pro well, or con but syrup on my ice cream but, eh, that's <laughs> yeah <just me. laughs> anyway catch us uh, next tuesday and then again of course next week uh next thursday 10 p.m central time